Hume's critique of social contract theory contains three key observations. First, no government in the world traces its origin back to an original, freely adopted contract. Right. Now, no government may be an exaggeration, but most of the major governments of his time and our time do not. Right? Let's take England. Well, where does England trace the origins of its government to? William the Conqueror, right? someone who came in and took England by force. And of course, there were all kinds of civil wars and other things down the line. Okay. France, right? well, what we, have, what we had then in France right, had similar problems in the past. Right? And what we have now in France was instituted after World War II in some measure by the Allies, the Free French, etc. Right? But not by everyone in society coming together and sitting down and making a contract. Right? The one key exception that I can think of is Spain, right? where they actually did have a vote. Will we be a democracy or not in the 70s? Right? But even there, it wasn't like they had this wide menu of options and this massive public conversation. Right? The dictator died. When he died, he turned over power to the king, and as soon as the king came into power, he immediately held an election, democracy, yes or no. Right? So no, the social contract theory does not represent the origins of any government, or at least very few governments in existence. The second observation is that hardly anybody consents to a social contract. Right? When you turned 18, nobody handed you a copy of the Constitution and asked you to sign it. There may be some countries in the world that do that, but it's very rare, right? You're born into the country, the government is in existence, and you pretty much have to live with it when you grow up, right? So people don't routinely consent to some kind of social contract. And third, and perhaps most importantly, everybody knows this and nobody cares, right? The fact that the, so if someone comes along and points out to you, look, there's reason to think that the Constitution was adopted through lots of political chicanery, right? It's not clear that it was even legal to hold the Constitutional Convention, right? And then there's some really questionable things about several of the ratification process in several of the states, etc., right? You might say, oh, what an interesting historical fact, but you're probably not going to say, well, now I want to scrap the Constitution. Right? And of course, nobody asked you to sign the Constitution when you turned 18. Right? Now, on two occasions, I've been asked to sign the Constitution, actually three. Right? Once was symbolic on Constitution Day. There was a student group that asked me to do so. The second was when I, in a, I a sense, had to sign the Constitution because to work at the polls in California, I had to sign a loyalty oath. And the third was when I moved to Arizona and took a job with ASU, I had to sign a loyalty oath. Right? But for most people, right, the Constitution is just there and they accept it. Right? And even though they never consented to it, right, and it's a kind of tricky question whether there was really a free consent to it in the beginning at all by the people, nobody cares. Right? We still accept the authority of the Constitution, just like the British accept the authority of their Parliament and King, okay, France of its National Assembly, etc. Right? So the three major observations are first, Few countries, if any, can trace their origin back to a free contract. Second, even if they could, right, people don't routinely assent to the contract on coming of age. Right? It's just expected that they'll agree to it. And third, everybody knows this and nobody cares. Right? And governments don't suffer any loss in their authority in the eyes of the people due to the fact that the people know this right, and don't care.